Welcome to another episode of the Paid Play Profit Podcast. Today, we're going to dive into planning your 2022 summer sale success. I really can't take credit for this episode. It came from the beautiful mind of Mary Beth Pennington here on our team at the bottom line. And I'm proud to say that she's also a guest for today's podcast. Hey, Mary Beth. Hey, how are you doing? Doing well. Welcome to the show. You ready to dive into summer sales success? Diving in. Summer's swimming. Yes. (laughs) All right. Here we go. Okay, Mary Beth, here we are, the two peas in a pod, talking about summer sales success. It's April at the time that we're releasing this episode, and I'm excited about this conversation because it's almost feels a little to me since I'm over sales here at the bottom line you could feel like you're actually a little too late for the summer sales party at the end of April but I don't think so do you I don't think so it's not warmed up yet you know you've not planned everything there's still things time to tweak some things yeah and you know what I loved about this when you presented the idea actually back in March you actually offered up this idea for us to focus on this in April. And it really inspired me because so many times as business owners and entrepreneurs, we look forward to summers as time for play and vacation. And a lot of times our seasons are let's ramp up for the end of the year, not necessarily summer. And I think there was just a nice healthy challenge for me personally about yeah let's start thinking about our summer and what summer could look like because I'm I'm going to be honest I'm kind of in I hope to be off for a few weeks in summer and I'm not really interested in hitting the gas per se so I think seeding this is wonderful yeah my thought is if you can get your ducks in a row early then you have time to take a summer vacation and really enjoy it without worrying or thinking, oh my, I wonder if I'm hitting the goals. If you set it in motion now, prepare and put it in motion now, you'll be able to breathe easier in the summer. Yeah, at least have a plan, whatever that plan looks like, whether a plan, I mean, I think success is up to the person that defines success, right? So I think one of the things that I'd like to say is it's about you, dear listener, the success that you want this summer. It's not someone else's version of success and what that looks like, because where you're at in your business, the season that you're in in your business, this is just a nice time to reflect on what kind of growth and success your way is that going to look like this summer. Is that fair, Mary Beth? I agree. Yeah. All right. So Five things that we're going to talk about here today, Mary Beth. We're going to talk about data, which is a historical view of what we need to do in order to prepare for our summer success. We're going to talk about outcomes, which is our future and essentially our goals that we want to develop throughout the summer. We're going to talk about tracking because you cannot meet what you do not measure, which is staying present on what's working and what's not working. We're going to talk about strategy, like how are we, this is kind of a marketing and sales initiative, so we can't leave strategy out of the conversation, and how are we going to get in front of more people to do the thing we need to do, and then last but not least, in any way, shape, or form, is the capacity conversation, because every decision is a profit decision, and profit is measured in time, energy, and money, and do we have the time, energy, and money to pull everything off that we want to accomplish? So those are kind of the five things that we're going to kind of walk through together to help our listeners plan for their 2022 summer sales success. So let's dive right in to the data piece of this. So why is data so important, Mary Beth, the historical perspective of data? How can you plan for the future if you don't even know where you've been? Mm-hmm. That, that's a huge thing. What is that saying from if Ben Franklin? Yeah, you if you to fail plan. to plan, yeah, you plan to fail. So it's when you use numbers, that's concrete evidence. You can't like make it look like it's something it isn't. That's concrete statistics. Mm-hmm. So knowing which numbers to look at, that's important. 
and then how to follow those in a trend is also important. Yeah, it really does give you some perspective on what did I do? And if I have nothing to look back on historically, that's going to develop like, okay, I, I actually need something. I don't even have what I need because I can tell you now there's plenty of times where people would say, well, Jessica, what does the data say? And I'm like, it would be very difficult to pull it. Mm -hmm. um, it would take time because it wasn't like mm -hmm. super present, you know, and what we know about marketing and sales is data, data, data. Like you've been one of the strongest advocates for like, well, what are the numbers? And I got to know the why and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and would you think it's fair to say that you actually love seeing that data? I do. You know, if you don't track it all the time, I think it can be scary. Like you're afraid of what it might show. But if you just consistently track it weekly, monthly, quarterly, you're going to know what your year is looking like. And you're going to be able to, in, with much safer parameters, predict what next year will look like. Yeah. You know, prediction is never fun. I don't like predicting, but you do have to plan. You have to, like, you're going to plan for your summer. How do you know? what to buy, what products you need, how much time you have to invest if you do not have data from, for instance, last summer. Yeah. Or just even a running trend. Like one of the things we track on our scorecard weekly and our client acquisition team is how many new sales did we actually generate or new partnership proposals, if you will. And we see it every single week. And that's been hugely, is that even a word? That's been very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and motivating. And it's really an on track or off track situation, but we won't dive too far into that, but we need data. And so dear listener, if you don't have data that you can reflect on or easily access, then that might be an indication of that's what your summer sales success is going to look like, <laughs> that you need to put some infrastructure around data in place. And if you struggle with what kind of data to pay attention to for sales perspectives, in our business and like any other business, it's a numbers game. And one of the biggest driving factors is, are we creating new sales? And so that would be a good place to start. It's like, how many new sales did we create in this past week or month, if you will? And maybe there's a way for you to easily go back and pull, pull the last six months or last summer or something if you don't necessarily have it handy. And sometimes it's just a matter of, it can be total sales. It can be sales during a specific time. Like if you, it could be sales of a, a certain product, you know, what's going to do well this summer? Well, if you pull last year's sales data on beach balls and footballs, which did better, you know, right. uh, it's maybe where I mean, old customers compared to new customers. Yeah. You know, yeah. Those, are, those are stats you can pull. I love that contribution. The data needs to be meaningful for the place you're at now and where you're going. Because we can have tons of data, but meaningless data doesn't really help us. We need yeah. useful data. And it's an art to kind of decide what useful data that's meaningful actually is. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked a lot about, okay, we need data because we need to know where we're going. And if, frankly, if where we're going is delusional or not <laughs> in relation to where we were. So we need outcomes, outcomes. So we've did the historical view. Now we need to kind of craft or vision cast our future. And what is the goal or the outcome that we're hoping for during the summer? Well, one of the things I would say is like, what are the dates that start and end summer, right? Like if you're going to create yeah. a goal, we need to know, well, when is the, our summer season? Is it four months, three months, two months? When does it start? When does it end? Uh, what right. would you say summer, the summer season is, Mary Beth, as a date? Well, being a former teacher, you know, it's pretty much June, July, and August, you know, June, July and August. but I know if you are, if you are an online seller, you are ramping up for Christmas mm -hmm. starting in August and maybe even before. So going um, back to school in August, you know, maybe yeah. that's part of your summer sales success that you're True. planning yeah. for the big back to school campaign. A lot of times you can't get people to participate, but you've got to kind of strategically structure your season around your campaigns, you know, and when do your clients make purchases or decisions? 
in your business. So I definitely think setting outcomes has to have dates, defined dates. So you know what you're doing for sure. And then deciding like, what are you trying to chase? Are you trying to chase a dollar? Are you trying to chase the number of leads? Are you, because maybe your sales are coming in the future. Maybe it's not about new sales during summer, but it's about priming in the summer for those future sales in Q3, Q4. I don't know. But what do we know about outcomes, Mary Beth? What do we have to have when we set goals for sure? Um, So that everyone stays on the same page. Well, I I like that acronym, that SMARTER, making Mm -hmm. goals the smarter way, Mm -hmm. which to me, that that's a good way to look at making or or to, to craft a goal is a smarter using the smarter technique now I've now got to that's an, the now that that yeah so now that's an expansion of the smart goal and mm-hmm. when we started working with Michael Hyatt and his team through business accelerator and full focus resources they actually are the first team that I know of that expanded to the smarter goal so can mm-hmm. it's an acronym s-m-a-r-t-e-r so why don't you tell us what the acronyms mean the letters right, mean so acronym s The first S is for specific. So your goal has to be very specific. M is for measurable. That means there's something, some data that you can measure from it. Attainable, is it realistic? Actually, that's the second, that's the fourth one. Attainable, and then is it realistic? Timely is T, so that's smart. That puts a start and a finish on it, being timely. And then the the ER at the end is exciting and relevant. I love the so, exciting part. Do you yeah, know why I love you know, the exciting part? Like, what does that mean? Why is that? No, it, I mean, what does it I, mean? It just reminds me of Jessica. <laughs> That's so funny. Why does that it remind you of me? Exciting. To Jessica or to all of us? Yeah, no, for Jessica, things have to be exciting. That's it's just got to be fun in some way, even if it's the worst thing ever. We got to make this exciting in some way. Well, we do make serious work fun around here, right? That's true. We do, and that's important. But I loved that addition to an age-old acronym about how to set smart goals, because if we're not excited about it. There is an emotional component to setting goals. And if you're not excited about it and you can't see the path to get excited about it, that means you're really not bought into the idea. You're just kind of doing something because it's a nice or smart idea. It's a smart idea for us to do this, but we don't know the bigger why. Because I think the exciting piece is really kind of honing in on why this goal right now, you know, which I know the relevant makes it like, This is why we must do it right now. But it's bigger than making sure that, because we're a team here at the bottom line, right? Right. And we all chase outcomes together and we chase outcomes as individuals. And it's got to be exciting to the whole because it's going to take all of us to pull this off in one way or another. And I just think that part gets left out a lot. And if I would add another piece to this is what is the reward yeah. On the other side of the goal, which again is another Michael Hyatt thing through his full focus planner and, and the way that they do best year ever and establish goals. Like we've done rewards here at, at TBO with our goal setting. Have you locked that? Because it's been fairly new in I the last it. 18 months. I love it. You know, we could make it smarter goals with the <laughs> reward at the end. <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> But yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, when you make a goal, that's a long-term goal, like let's, I would call a summer a lot. If you made a goal for the entire summer and it's a long-term to me, that's long-term. Okay. Now there are longer goals. Of course there are Mm -hmm. annual goals, that kind of thing. But if that's basically, if you're talking about three months, you're talking about something equivalent to a quarter Mm -hmm. and, or the time space in a quarter. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you're going to reward yourself to keep it exciting, I would set a reward every 30 days or so. If it's the idea of of goal setting is hard, number one, and number two, really achieving that goal. If you're having difficulty achieving the goal, reward yourself more often. 
Yeah, you figure know? out ways to celebrate for sure. Like those milestones. Are we hitting our yes. milestones and are those happening? Because that in and of itself is most definitely a reward that you got to the place that you needed to be in order to get to where you're going, especially when you can do that on time. Because what we've also learned is that we need to leave room for changing and shifting and milestones. Once they're set, they're moving a lot. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> But the big thing is that reward at the end, because I really do buy into the idea that it can't just be about achieving the thing. We have to figure out a very physical, tangible way to celebrate the thing that we just did. And our team really does love the rewards part. And I have to tell you, that's a really hard thing to figure out how to create rewards too. So we started posting surveys so you guys with ideas so you guys could decide what rewards were going to happen at the end of those goals do you like being able to contribute to the idea of what you're going to get I love that Mm. and I love seeing how the the whole group chooses most of the time what I have voted for we didn't I didn't get (laughs) but that's okay because the group wants to do something and we make it some fun activity and we report on it yeah. So definitely reward yourself. It's important. Even if it's the, if you achieve the goal or you achieve it at 80%. Now there's something we haven't talked about is how right. much of this goal do we need to achieve? But if you've achieved it, please reward yourself, whatever, oh. make it in, in the beginning, determine what that reward will be. Oh, that's so smart when you brought that up of like, when is the goal done? Because a lot of people think it's 100% done, which means you're not rewarding the substantial level of progress. Mm -hmm. So now I have to tell you, uh, we can't just give participation trophies out. We're not doing that around here for sure. But I think there's something really valid that we've been learning through the EOS process is that to expect 100% perfection is kind of like it's a fool's errand. But there are things, did we hit it or did did we not? And establishing what a hard goal is and a hard outcome versus like describing what the win is, like defining success, like success will be if we accomplished 80% of the milestones. So again, that's why goals are so personal and you have to really get clear about what those are. And I know, Mary Beth, we're stopping at this stop sign a little longer than we need to. But I think this is actually very important because this is the difference between everybody doing what they need to do and getting to the same place at the end or not. A really bad goal is only a bad goal when everyone thinks you're chasing something different. (laughs) You know, Mm, when you go off and do one thing because you think it's going to get us there and I go off and do another thing mainly because the goal just wasn't super clear and well-defined. And so we're all working independently to get to the same place, realizing halfway through, we weren't all working on the same goal. So I think that's- And that is, goal, goal, writing out a goal or determining a goal is is kind of hard. I mean, we've been doing it for several quarters now and we're not perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. So give yourself some leeway Give yourself a break. If you don't, if you don't write the goal, change it. Mm -hmm. As time goes through and you're realizing this is never going to work. And we've been there. Mm -hmm. We've gotten through halfway through a goal and thinking this is not even possible. This was not realistic when we wrote it, but we thought it was. Mm -hmm. So it's okay because it takes a long time to learn to make really good goals, but and we do Try think it's out. okay. Yeah, we think it's okay when we learn. That is a measure of success yes. in our, inside our business. Is have we learned what we needed to learn, and do we have a plan for change? I mean, that's what I look for all the time. Yep. yep. So now that we've dealt with the historical data and the future outcomes for our summer sales success, we've got to talk about the present, meaning the tracking. And honestly, it really is that data conversation. What are we going to measure every week or every month so that we know whether we're on track or off track so we can discuss what's working and not working? That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Would you agree, Mary Beth? I think so. Yes. And too many numbers that you, you know, I would think the big thing that we've learned is that when you have a weekly number, one person needs to know what number they're supposed to obsess about every week so that hopefully it stays on track 80% of the time so that you're driving the outcome you need to be driving and you get to where you need to be at the end. 
And that's kind of like new. That goes back to that. Make sure the data you're tracking is useful and meaningful and that you can actually do something about it because just informational data versus actionable data are two different things. I'm going to agree with you there because even as we've been tracking data for a long time, but we have changed a lot of how we, of what we track, first of all, and, or we will track something for a long time and it doesn't seem to, to have any relationship with the numbers that are coming as far as cash flow or just sales. And then, so we'll have to go back to that and see, is this stuff relevant for what we're doing? That is a big part of it. Relevancy. I think part of, yeah, relevancy and what data is informational to help you make decisions on what's working and what's not working. And then what data is something you're supposed to obsess about so that you can keep it on track at the frequency you've decided it needs to stay on track for. Because no one should really be surprised when they go to report their number on Monday about what happened last week with their data if they were obsessing about it all week the week prior, right? And they're going to be well prepared for that, which means they're also going to be well prepared to like discuss how we're going to get this back on track or are we chasing the wrong thing? And I think that that that's been a wonderful part of the process. So that's pretty much our historical, our future, and our now. And that's a lot of work, (laughs) honestly. There's a lot of work, dear listener, packed into those three things. It's I kind of liken this to painting a room. Have you ever just been like, I'm going to paint this room? That's my goal. And you're like, (laughs) (laughs) okay, well, I'm just going to talk about from my lens then. I would love a new color on this room. And I am never excited about the moving of the furniture, the washing of the walls, the patching of the holes. Mm -hmm. I am never excited about all the prep it takes in order to get the room to the beautiful, most perfect color that I have in my mind. And I liken these three things to that process when you're painting. Like that's all the stuff that has to happen before you paint. So now that we've got kind of those things down, I think painting is the strategy. Like this is where it starts to have all its color. And we get really excited about the strategy because the strategy is all about what things are we going to do to execute and create a plan and execute on it. And this has a lot to do uh, based on what you shared with me about visibility and outreach. So what are kind of the two things that people need to think about in their strategy when it comes to planning their summer sales success one would be kind of like visibility and one would be outreach right so why don't you expand on those two things for us Mary Beth well I think visibility is are you being sociable like are you are you putting yourself out there are you putting your business out there what is your marketing are you marketing to the right people One of the things that might help is when you think about who you are serving, we use the word avatar around here, but it's, it's the, your ideal customer Mm -hmm. who is already servicing one, like your competition. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, that's someone uh, go find out who they are, who's, who's going after the same avatar you are. And maybe I don't know what what else would you want to know it's good to know who your competition is but sometimes you have a niche that what you perceive as competition their niche is slightly different so really learning about who your competition is and who they're actually serving sometimes you can pull that particular what you thought was a competitor onto your own team meaning you kind of partner with them and make a little deal like, hey, let me advertise some of what you've got. If you'll advertise what some of what I've got on your website or on your Facebook page or whatever it is. And then you you kind of collaborate in a sense with people you would never think to collaborate with. Yeah, kind of being very open-minded about what your outreach could look like because Outreach could be direct and outreach could be indirect, right? And I have to admit that takes a little bit of planning to go collaborate and borrow from other people's audiences because a lot of times, you know, we're all well dialed into our plans. And so it's kind of like it could be a grenade to some or 
what have you. But let's talk about the visibility piece first, because I know sometimes when even with us, like I have been very like I've had to move into let's create brand awareness or brand visibility like and basically what you told me is like we got to get into the spotlight Jessica you know like mm-hmm. we got to make That's sure your that favorite place <laughs> yeah I know it's not at all no. <laughs> not for myself individually and I'm really shy about it with the brand as a whole and I've had to practice this art of visibility and being comfortable and courageous with it because I'm certainly not at ease with it and I'm definitely most challenged by it but it's key people got to be able to see you that no like and trust gets built over time and they need to be able to see you hear you read from you and they just need to see you being sociable like you you saying the first thing be sociable and I'm like well what does that look like because me running around on Facebook commenting on posts and engaging in communities isn't necessarily my idea of fun but again it's a lot like success you've got to define what sociable looks like for your brand and for yourself and for your industry and your business so I really just want to guard people from like taking just a cookie cutter definition of these words we're using and making sure that they're defining it for themselves but not defining it for their comfort yes because this is being out there, it's comfort is not a thing you're going to know. You can't be comfortable and be sociable unless you're like the world's greatest extrovert. And most of us are not, yeah. you know, we're a little smattering, but it is true. If people cannot, if people cannot see you, they will not trust you. Yeah. And I can at, tell at you, the we're at least yeah. your brand. Yes. We are more visible now because of the team, because if it were up to me, we'd just be like little quiet mouse on a hill and we'd just wait for the people to come to us because they heard about us. A lot like Hitch, that movie Hitch, somebody Mm, passed a black card to somebody else and that's how they learned about us. Like that would suit me just fine to just have strategic referral word of mouth because we were that good at what we did and we gave our clients everything they needed to pass it along to the most ideal person but we're also called to impact a lot of businesses and a lot of business owners and that requires us to be brave in the world and to do brave big things and I have to tell you Mary Beth I do it more because of you and the team and we do it more as a brand because of the team for sure because we can't plan for comfort when it comes to marketing no so here's some suggestions Mm -hmm. okay So if you are not already, maybe look for some associations you can be. I know we're talking to online entrepreneurs, so it's not like you just go down to the local marketing uh, meeting, you know, somewhere. Mm -hmm. It it has to be online. So associations, look for masterminds that you can become a part of. That way your face is showing up. Online groups that are specific to your business. Mm -hmm. Even like civic groups sometimes may help you. You could also consider speaking at events. And by events, I don't mean like you have to go down to the Hyatt Regency. Is that even a place anymore? To, to do a, you know, a big conference. How about like a podcast? What? Mm-hmm. A podcast. How about make maybe writing an article for, for like a trade magazine or something like that? Mm-hmm. Um, I read those. I read those. And I see people, lots of articles by people just like you and me. You have to be active on social media and there's a hundred thousand platforms you can choose from. Find the one where your avatar is hanging out. Where's your ideal customer hanging out? If they're on TikTok, guess what? Make you a 15 second video. If they're not, you know, maybe that's a, um, you're on Facebook or something else, but you have to be interactive as well. And also frequency. You have to be consistent and you have to do it pretty often Mm -hmm. to keep your name out there. That's, that's important. Yes. Consistency and frequency are a major part of putting yourself out there. Yeah. And what I love about this conversation is, well, Shane Sams of Flip Lifestyle, he has a membership master's program for marketing, but he always talks about prolific marketing. And he says, you've got to be everywhere. When I hear that, I'm exhausted. 
Mm-hmm. I don't tie into it at all. And this is going to build us right into the capacity conversation in just a second. But what I want to say to the person listening is that if you're struggling with the idea that you have to do all these things, you are not alone. Because we're only to point number four of five on how to plan summer sales success. Mary Beth just said in her mind, that's June through August. And by the time you're listening to this, it's April the 26th. And you might be listening to it later, but this is when the episode dropped in 2022. And so the idea that you have to pull this gargantuan plan together by summer could seem so overwhelming that you do nothing at all. But what I want to encourage you to do right now is don't do nothing. Decide what you can do in the season that you're in and just be consistent to act on that. And maybe it's just you've never had a plan for the summer and you're just going to dive in and start figuring out what that even looks like for you. That might be what summer sales success looks like for you. Maybe you're a pro at planning and you've done this before and you're ready to elevate this to the hills. But being social and being prolific, it can be exhausting. And so I just want you to know that that's, it's really important to decide where to be and what you're going to do and then just be consistent at it. And we can't be consistent at everything. Right, Mary Beth? Right. Just pick one. If you're starting out, pick one. Yeah, pick something. Now this, I think is, I think what's really good about this and the borrowing audiences that Mary Beth talked about, the outreach, like finding out, this was also a really gold nugget that Mary Beth dropped here for you is that it doesn't matter what you want. It matters what your person that you want to serve wants and where that person is. Now, I can tell you, my team will tell you that I vehemently say all the time, we're not doing TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) And they they repeatedly keep bringing up TikTok. And I'm kind of like, I just don't think that our person is on the TikTok. And what I'm really saying is I don't want to be on the TikTok. And I'm not sure if our person is on the TikTok. And they're not sure either, because the only way we're going to find out is if we go on a little experimental journey to see if TikTok has any impact on what we do. But my comfort is holding us back in this area. But again, it's also about strategic seasons for when to create outreach and how to do that. So I'm just kind of being transparent about that process too. I guess if we need to be on the TikTok, Mary Beth, we'll decide when we got to go down that road. And we'll stop calling it the TikTok at that point. (laughs) That's what I call all those social outlets because I load them so much. The Facebook, the Twitter, the TikTok. Oh Uh, my, yeah. The YouTube, like I'm just, that's my old soul crying out and saying, I don't want to be here, but I know we must. No, we haven't, we haven't dived into TikTok. I think the first step would be even like we're at is, we got to go see if our competition is on TikTok. And well, our audience. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Our and audience. Comp- yeah. Well, yeah. well, that's how you find our audience is mm-hmm. you look at our competition, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to me, I go find, I'll go find some other, other businesses that are similar to ours mm-hmm. and see what the interaction is. Mm-hmm. That's where you start. Yeah. If you don't know where to start. Go check out your competition, see what's happening with them. Yeah, you know, and I think in marketing, there's that experiment cycle that you have to go in just to see if that's what you should mm-hmm. do. And then there's like, now that we've experimented that this is a good idea and that we've seen some fruit from it, now it's time to kind of dive into it more. So I think there's stages and phases to marketing as well that for those of you who struggle to make marketing a big, huge priority to any level, you know, it's a process for sure. It is, it is. totally a process. Now let's go into capacity. This is the fifth thing, but actually I think it's the most fundamental thing and it ties into the truth that we know. At, there's two things that we know at the bottom line. Number one, every decision is a profit decision and profit is measured in time, energy, and money. And the second thing that we know is that your yes is expensive, so invest it wisely, okay? And in terms of capacity, There's your capacity and your team's capacity. And you might be a one-person team. You could be a two-person team, a 10-person team, a 100-person team. 
And so part of planning your 2022 summer sales success means that you're anticipating and frankly expecting growth. Would you say that's a fair assessment, Mary Beth? Yes. You're planning I, I, for growth. It better be. <laughs> you better you're better be. You're planning for growth. And it's going to require resources to attract the growth and acquire the growth. And then there's going to be resources that are needed to serve the growth that came as a result of those efforts. And I can tell you right now, planning for capacity can't happen the moment that you decide you don't have it and you need it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is almost a double-edged conversation because the moment you need to hire for help is way back there because I can promise you this, your hire will never come as fast as you need. And when you hire them on the fly, you're going to expect them to fly the plane on their own in the first five days and they're not going to. And so this is a bit of a double-edged sword where we as leaders have to really take a hard look at capacity and what is actually possible when it comes to what we're asking for like 2022 summer sales success. And I know that this is probably not a really popular part of this conversation. Do you think it's going to be Mary Beth? I mean, most people in my mind are thinking, I can't afford that. Oh, that's one of the things. I can't afford that. I can't afford help. I'm just going to have to hustle and get in there. And yes, some of our seasons are about, I got to be able to do this with the one person team I am right now, which is why you have to be very realistic about what you can consistently pull off because especially with your marketing, doing it for 10 days and then doing it no more doesn't give you the data you need to figure out if it's working most of the time. It just doesn't. And you only have so much time, energy, and money to do what it is you need to do. And counting the costs before you actually invest those costs is not very popular, especially in entrepreneurial endeavors and with people that are like and I'm one of those like let's do it let's figure it out put the plane in the air and we'll land it somewhere when we need to refuel and we know too as a team that's fatiguing but entrepreneurial organizations are wired that way we just have Mm -hmm. to figure out how to strike the right balance and so that's what I have to say about capacity but there could be things that you could outsource that you don't necessarily have to train somebody to do that there's right. experts out there for specific tasks that you could outsource for. And those are very realistic, but there's still onboarding and ramp up that has to happen, even with those types of hires. There is. But I think I think the first thing you, you might need to think about, other than can you afford it? And that's definitely a thing to think about. But think about what is the thing you hate to do the most in your business? You know, or what are you just terrible at? If you can't keep your books, hire somebody to keep your books. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you have no idea what the latest trend in marketing is, and you don't even know what the TikTok is, <laughs> then maybe it's time that you, <laughs> right, that you, uh, that you do not, that you just look for somebody you can. Maybe it's, you need to hire a marketer. So, There are things that you just cannot do well. Everybody has their things. Yes. Start with those things. Mm -hmm. Even if it's one, one thing this summer, I'm, you know, I cannot, I don't have time to do my books. I'm too busy making my product. Find you a bookkeeper. And yes, it does take time. You got to find the right fit and that kind of thing. But uh, once it's off your shoulders, you're like, ah, I should have done this long ago. Right. And that usually doesn't happen. I mean, it might ha- it might feel like a honeymoon the first two weeks, but then reality is going to set in that there's no perfect process. There's no perfect person. Because here's the thing, peeps, that I'm going to say that's not popular at all. And I've learned from I have the scar and not the wound here. Delegation cannot be your abdication of your leadership and what you have delegated. You better and- say that again. Delegation cannot be your abdication of the leadership you delegated. Man, that's some heavy stuff. And it and happens a lot. The hard way, it right? happens a lot with bookkeeping since you use that as an example. And we didn't plan that, folks, because this is not a scripted conversation. But a lot of times people will be like, just outsource your books. And then you still don't know your numbers. 
because you've not only outsourced your books and delegated that task that you don't like, you've convinced yourself you're not the right person to know your numbers, and you've abdicated your role in guiding your company by understanding your financials. And then you're surprised when you don't know what's happening or you're having to go pull on that line of credit way before you thought you were going to have to or that you thought you were going to have $100,000 in sales when you only ended up with 10. And there are ways to know that that's happening well before the reality of that happening a year later. We say all the time around here, all the tax planning in the world isn't going to prepare you to pay the bill. And so there's a lot, especially around your finances, that cause a lot of stress for our clients in particular. And it's not really an easy problem to solve, but let's take it to Facebook ads. Just because you hired the best Facebook marketer, if it's not translating to new sales, you cannot blame them. (laughs) You cannot abdicate the fact that you stopped paying attention and I'm kind of being a little soapboxy here, but like this is, there's a difference between delegation and abdication and it's important we all understand the difference. And if you're expecting a 1099 contractor to own anything in your business, that's probably not a great idea either because I've never really met 1099 contractors who actually fully and wholly own the results all the way through. Not really. That's been my experience. That may not be yours, but capacity is real. Your capacity, your team's capacity, whether it's W-2, 1099, part-time, full-time, and delegation cannot be your abdication. And that is something that's extremely important because you will continue to have issues with capacity if you do not learn how to plan for capacity. And so that's it. I mean, I feel like we might be ending on a low note, if you will, because it can feel really overwhelming that you don't have everything you need to do what you need to do. But I will tell you that you absolutely do have everything you need in order to do what you need to do right now. So if you buy into the lie that you don't, then you're setting yourself up for failure right now because the game starts with your mind. You're planning your 2022 summer sale success starts in your mind. If you're going to drive success, define it and then go for it. What else would you add, Mary Beth? I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I, I really, you kind of summed it up. There are pros and cons of everything, but don't just say I can't do it mm-hmm. because then you come out with nothing you know, or something much less than you even, you know, if you lowballed it and you come out less than your low ball, that's horrible. Make a plan. Yeah. Start what you can do. I, I like that. What yeah. you can do, do what you can. Start with what you can do and just start learning what you need to learn every step of the way, because there's more coming. There's mm. more coming. And what I love about this is we're being very proactive. The reactive person says, I'm waiting for Q4 and my ship will sail on that date in Q4. And that's a Sunday statement. And when we can actually be proactive, what you build today creates what you own tomorrow. So what does summer success look like for you? And be very mindful of where you're at and take guard of your mind because you're get, you will win the war basically because you believed you could. You just got to know which war you're trying to win this summer. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would say that that's a, that's a wrap folks. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the pay play profit podcast. I hope that Mary and Mary Beth and I's conversation has inspired you to plan your 2022 summer success, summer sales success. That's a tongue twister. Um, What I can say about anyone listening, even though we might not know you, we believe that whatever you set your mind to, you can absolutely do it. And if Marilyn were here, she would say, thank you so much for joining us. Now, before we go at sharing is caring time, we want you to join us each week. So if you haven't already hit subscribe for this podcast, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen, please do so now. We would also love for you to consider leaving a five-star review or share this episode with a fellow e-commerce, online, or service-based business owner 
that you think would benefit from gaining more pay, play, and profit in their business and life today. We hope you join us next week. And until then, be kind to yourself and each other. This is Jessica May and Mary Beth signing off, y'all. Bye-bye.